Good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning. Our prayer is that as you watch the service online this morning that you'll get a blessing out of it. Though we'd love to all be together here face to face to worship our Lord Jesus this morning, but uh, this, His God's Spirit can still join us together as we tune in and worship Him together this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, may God bless you this morning. Let's pray before we continue with our service this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this wonderful day you've given us. We thank you, though we cannot be together as believers that we'd, we'd love to be, but Lord, we pray that you'll all bind us together this morning. We want to worship and honor you with our lives, not just this morning, but through the week and our work, we pray that you'll give us the strength, the wisdom, where we can let our light shine through hard times, through difficult times, and we can uh, be a light in this world. We'll trust in you. We know you'll guide us. You'll protect us. We thank you so much for all the blessings you give us every day. We pray for each and everybody that serves this morning, that you'll give them the joy and the thankful heart so we can do that in honor honor you and we get a blessing out of it lord where you can feel honored and uh, your name will be glorified through this in jesus name amen before we go on let's just look into the bulletin a little bit so we can remind us of something that will be going on during the week it's planned, we're planning, if everything works out, to have the annual membership meeting this Saturday, 3rd, October 3. We'll start at 4 p.m. with a supper here at the church. 
and the meeting will start at 6.30 p.m. for elections. And we'll also, the same evening, we'll have a nomination or a deacon election, deacon and lay minister election by open ballot. So please keep that in mind when you come out Saturday that pray about it so the Lord can put on your heart who you want to put down as a couple of more deacons and a lay minister. The worship committee has a sign-up sheet pinned on the back there. Whenever you have a chance, please stop by and sign up what you'd like to do, whether you'd like to serve it on Sunday morning for a special presentation in either language, German or English. And we're still hoping we'll be able to do communion soon, so as soon as the first, the earliest date where the opportunity allows, we can all be together again, we want to do a communion. The park committee is looking for volunteers, so please uh, remember, keep this in mind, mark it on your calendars. The third week of October, they'll be looking for volunteers to put up a roof over the volleyball court. Please uh, save that date and prepare for that. An attention of marriage, Abram Fair and Giselle Posada are pleased to announce their wedding. They're getting married next Sunday, October 4, unless somebody has any concerns about it with a valid reason they shouldn't. Talk to Pastor John, and uh, if it's a valid reason, he will stop it, but I don't think that will most likely won't happen. So congratulations to Abram and, and Giselle. It's too bad they're not here this morning, because I would make them come up here and do a little dance for us or something. but. Um, we will pray for you, let's pray for them, that God will bless their marriage with a lot of happiness, a lot of kids, and a lot of, no, nah, you don't need money to be happy, so we pray that God will really bless your marriage and, and uh, be with you as you go through this wonderful, exciting step of your life. I think that's it for the announcements. Thank you, worship team, for being ready. So they'll serve us in song. And today is a pastor pulpit exchange for this region. So we have Blaine and Melissa with us this morning. Blaine will speak to us here. Pastor John and Mary Ann are in Spanish Lookout, and Peter and Judy Cron are in Shipyard. And the Y will not be part of this exchange this time because there is a border in between. So our borders are no go right now. So. Otherwise, Pastor Diedrich would be here somewhere in Blue Creek, I believe, or in, in Belize somewhere. But anyway, God bless all of you as you listen to our service this morning. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Psalm 145, verse 3. Let's sing, How Great Thou Art.
Amazing grace, my chains are gone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. so sweet to trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. 
Good morning. We're on. Oh boy. What was that? Someone is uh, coming up with a good beat. I will not beatbox. I will not uh, speak to the beat. But I am looking forward to speaking this morning. I am glad to be a part of your service this morning. This is a little weird. Uh, but I am glad that we can do pulpit exchange, even though our churches are not yet meeting face to face. But I am sure thankful that we are fortunate to be able to read and to hear and to respond to God's word as we live our daily lives. Let's open up this time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we turn our attention to you and we thank you so much for the songs that we sang already this morning that turned our attention to you. We want to be free of distraction and so I pray Lord that you would help us to focus, help us to help us to look into your word and to and to learn from your word. Thank you Lord for who you are and we pray that that would come out clearly this morning. In Jesus name. Amen. There's a story that's told of a photographer and he takes photographs of kids at school. And like good photographers, he tries to make small talk with the children to make them feel a little bit more comfortable because pictures are just better when people are a little bit more relaxed. One little girl stepped up to the chair and sat down and she had a stressed out look on her face. The photographer kind of bent down and and said, hi there, what's your name? And the girl responded, and, and the photographer said, well, what, what are you going to be when you grow up? Asked the little girl. And the little girl became very anxious and kind of hung her head and replied, tired. How many of us agree with that statement today? How many of you are tired? Growing up is a bit tiring, isn't it? Growing up in our current culture and in the midst of our world situation, it seems like it's getting harder to get any rest. How many of you use the do not disturb function on your phone? I've had to learn how to use it. My mind has been racing in the past six months, much like most of our hearts and our minds. We're super connected to the world, and there is just a lot going on in the world, and for many of us, that makes us tired and overwhelmed. But God knows that. And something that I have found to be 100% true in all of this is that God gives us what we need in these times. And I believe one of the things that God can give us is rest. Rest is actually something that is essential for our bodies to function properly. Apparently, there is actually no recorded example of someone dying because of not sleeping. But they do estimate that after about 48 hours, you would probably go into a coma. You likely wouldn't survive past 11 days of no sleep. You see, important functions of the body are performed at night. Your brain sorts and processes the day's information. It's kind of like a secretary filing stuff away into into folder, folder files. Apparently, that's one of the reasons that you dream. I wonder what your brain is sorting through in those times when uh, you dream of public speaking in your underwear. Maybe sorting through your biggest fears. (laughs) It's your brain sorting everything out. There are other things that happen. Hormones flood your body at night. And that repairs the stuff that's been worn down during the day. Your immune system, that part of you that fights sickness, releases inflammation-fighting agents to help fight infections and trauma. So while you stop working, your body actually kind of kicks it into high gear. There was a day about a year ago where I decided to completely and utterly rest. All I wanted was to, for an hour or so, think about nothing and do nothing. After this hour, it actually didn't take an hour, but I recorded the results of this nothing 
rest experiment. Here's what I jotted down on November 13th of last year. I tried to think about nothing. I heard the birds singing, and I realized that I needed to feed them. I opened my eyes, and I saw an appliance that Mel wanted me to move. Ah, I should have done that a long time ago. I closed my eyes and completely relaxed them, and it took all of 10 seconds for me to think of how I needed to think about the message that I was preparing. I picked up my phone to jot down the thoughts. I had just thought about the message so that I would remember them. And then I got caught up with playing a game of golf on my phone. It is so hard to do and to think nothing. Today we want to explore how Jesus brings us to rest. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. Jesus has just issued some pretty strong warnings to those around him. And then we find some interesting statements he made, likely in a public area where many are gathered to hear him speak. And this is what Jesus says, and actually he starts off by I, probably more praying this. This is what he says in Matthew 11, verse 25 and 26. At this time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. And Jesus is saying, the ones that appear to be the smartest and most well-versed on the scriptures, they are not recognizing me. They are not receiving me. In this case, it was the Pharisees and teachers of the law. They were, they were making things more complicated than they needed to be. And thus, they actually couldn't recognize who Jesus was. This idea has kind of been on repeat in Matthew and in, and in Jesus' teaching. The kingdom is a, is a little bit upside down. It looks different than you would expect. Jesus says earlier that blessed are the poor in spirit, or blessed are those who mourn, or those who are meek, or those who hunger. They are blessed. Really? Yeah, because in God's kingdom they are blessed because that is where God's message can be received. Before this passage in chapters 8 through 10, we read of many and actually nine specific instances where Jesus ministers to those who were needy. Those who couldn't help themselves. Many of, who, many of those were the Pharisees who had rejected and pushed many other people out to the outskirts of society. And so he's talking to those that were pushed away to the outskirts of society. And here he says, you've been revealed in me to little children. People who hungered. People who couldn't help themselves. Those who were humble, the least of these. The ones who could accept it because they were empty. They had nowhere else to turn. This is actually an important part of Jesus' ministry. Jesus also makes the statement, I reveal you, Father, in verse 27. He says, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am the perfect representation of you. If people want to know who you are, Father, they look to me. With those things in mind, the littlest ones able to understand Jesus' revelation and Jesus being revealing the Father, that sets the stage for perhaps the greatest invitation of all time by the greatest teacher of all time. This is what it says in verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What an invitation. The invitation that we're going to look at, this invitation has a few parts to it that we want to look at 
one at a time. The first part is come. Come. Sounds very much like the call to the first disciples in Matthew 4. It says this, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon Peter and Andrew, and he called to them, come, follow me. Come, follow me, fishermen. And the book continues to explain and show that Jesus calls ordinary people to follow him, to be his inner circle. These were fishermen, and we'll we'll read a little bit about a tax collector in a little bit. People who society would have said, they're ordinary. Perhaps even later on they call them sinners. The looked down upon. He says, come all. One of those tax collectors was Zacchaeus. And you remember what Jesus did there? What did he say to this tax collector in Luke? Come down from there. I'm coming to your house and we're going to dine together. Come down. I want to be with you. I want you to be with me. This got Jesus into some hot water, especially with Zacchaeus. We're told that when he called this man, the people muttered, Look, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Come all. Come to me all. Just before this, Matthew 11, Jesus calls another tax collector named Matthew, the one that is writing this. And after being questioned by the Pharisees, he says this statement. And it is one of those come to me all statements. It is the sick that need a doctor not the healthy. Why does Jesus say, blessed are the hungry? Because they know they need food. Why do the sick come and fall at Jesus' feet? Because they need it. They are at the mercy of Jesus. I I think of the, the lepers. They come to Jesus, have mercy on me, Lord. They have a burden And they believe Jesus can take that burden, can do something with that burden. Jesus says, burdens are welcome with me. In fact, I'm going to be harder on those who don't recognize that they have a burden to bear. Those that don't recognize their utter sinfulness. Those that think they are good or or at least better than the other guy. You see, Jesus is constantly being poked and prodded by some Pharisees who see themselves as pretty stinking good. They keep the law to the T, and they love to point out others' sinfulness. And before we think of someone else that does this, let's be real. We know from our own lives. We sometimes do this, pointing out someone else's sinfulness, because we actually want to feel better about our own lives. We're not as bad as those people. And so Jesus is extremely hard on the Pharisees that do this. They've claimed to follow God's law, but they've actually made it into a strictly legalistic practice without their hearts being close to him. They follow him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. Really, we don't need him because we're pretty good on our own. Jesus says, come to me. I am the solution to your weariness and your heavy burden. I will give you rest. Now we've got to notice Jesus is saying, come to me. He's calling people to himself. He isn't calling them to follow a certain movement. He isn't calling them to follow his disciples and even the church that they will start. He is calling them to follow him. The key to rest, the key to finding rest, is coming to Jesus himself. We we sang about this. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. It's spending time with Him. Have you ever been a part of a social group that has a list of unwritten rules? And you must follow those unwritten rules in order to gain acceptance by the group. It could actually be something like uh, being against something or someone. Or maybe even the other side, being for something or for someone. It could be thinking or behaving a certain way. In these social circles, we very quickly seek to gain membership with a group. 
by following their rules for acceptance. It's okay for a little while, but when this is the way it goes, obedience to the system that this social group has set up, in the final end, it will eventually feel very burdensome. This happened to the people of this time. Those that truly needed God's grace were pushed off to the outside. It was nearly impossible for the people on the outside to gain acceptance by especially the Pharisees. The fact of the matter is Jesus has extended that invitation to come to him for rest to all. And when we are in relationship with him, it is then we will rest and repair and renew. Just like our bodies do when they rest. So come, all, the burdened and the weary. The invitation is so far-reaching. I actually think that we are all in this boat, whether we want to admit it or not. Now, part two and three of this are kind of together. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Take and learn. And I believe that they're in that order for good reason. Take and then learn. What does yoke mean in this? Many of you have heard uh, this term, uh, the yoke. It's an agricultural instrument. It ties two oxen together. And then it makes it possible. Whew. Got warm up, yeah? Makes it possible that uh, the two oxen can be tied together and then also that farming implements like a plow can be attached to the animals. And it looks kind of like this, if you have the slide on your screen. The metaphor that Jesus is using here is that we should put a yoke on our backs. That's that cross piece of wood. And, and, it, and that, that, is, that is the picture. Usually they tried to make these yokes as light as possible so that the ox would be able to properly, uh, that it, they would be able to pull a heavy plow. It was supposed to make the job easier for the ox, not harder. It was also supposed to be used to tie two oxen together so that they could both work at the same task and not be pulling in different directions. This is where we would talk about not being unequally yoked. Going in two different directions, it splits people and that's no good in marriage. Uh, that's that's the, the term. What would often happen with these yokes was, would be that uh, a less experienced ox would be yoked to a more experienced ox, and thus the younger one would be shown the way the older one had learned the path or field or the task. As long as they were yoked together, there was little room for the less experienced ox to go to the right or to the left. It was a gentle way of learning the way. In essence, as long as the less experienced ox submitted to the leadership of the more experienced ox, the more restful the journey would be. If you look at that picture, what or who do you think Jesus is in this picture? My view in the past was that Jesus was on the plow. He put this yoke on us, even though it was a light one, but he put this yoke on us, and he was back there driving the plow. If we would just take the yoke of Jesus on, if we would promise to do what Jesus, the plow driver, wanted us to do, then all would go well. I even thought that if I could just do the right thing, it would be, maybe even be easy. But I think we have a different picture here. Who is Jesus in this picture? Could it be that Jesus is the more experienced ox? Could it be that we are yoked to Christ himself? It seems that way by this description. Could it be that the moment we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, he yokes us to himself? And at that moment, we begin the journey of life together. Maybe we could say in different terms that the journey of sanctification begins. And he's there beside us, gently and humbly leading us along. Oh, no, no, that's not the way to go. That's going to end badly for you. This is the way. And, and, and it's a gentle thing. 
So when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, he's saying, I'm here. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help teach you the right way to live. And, get this, I have the authority because the Father has committed this to me. I know the Father. I know the plow driver. He has entrusted this all to me. This is the way. This is the way. Come, follow me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. I won't whip you if you don't go the right way right away. You see, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The road is not easy, but the yoke is easy. I also think of uh, people on horses. What, what, what do they often say? They say, easy, with a little gentle tug at the reins. That's the way the Lord teaches. Easy. The burden of life might be very difficult, but the way Jesus teaches is light. It's full of grace and humble guidance. Often what happens when we join a social club is we must perform a certain way to be accepted. And so uh, the, the group sets on you a yoke of expectation that says, do this and do that, and then you'll be accepted. Jesus says, come, you are accepted. Now let me show you the way to live. There's a difference. There's a major difference. Jesus says, I'm with you in this process of sanctification. You've yoked yourself to me. Now I will show you. We could maybe say that salvation is recognizing that we can't pull, pull that plow on our own. Life's too difficult. Our hearts are too sinful. Saying, similar to what we talked about at the beginning, come all, it's saying, I'm at your mercy, Lord. I'm hungry. I need you. And I need you to first cleanse me from my sin, and then I need you to lead me in the way forward. The Pharisees put an impossible yoke on the people that they couldn't follow, and it was extremely burdensome. Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. I'll fulfill the law for you. That's the first way I'll give you rest. I'll sacrifice myself for you so that you can simply walk beside me and learn from me. I love that picture. Hebrews chapter 4 speaks about a Sabbath rest. And throughout Hebrews chapter 4, it's talking about rest. And this is what it says in Hebrews 4. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following there. That is the Israelites. He's been talking about that. Their example of disobedience. One thing I've wondered, why did God rest on the seventh day? Was he tired? I don't think he gets tired. No, he rested because he had worked. And the things that he had done were pronounced what? Very good. His work was complete. This is good. I'm done. The work is complete. What does Jesus say as he's on the cross bearing the burden? of our sin. It is finished. It's finished. It's done. This is good. The work is complete. The yoke of Christ says, the work I have done is complete. So it says that there, there is rest from works because Christ has done it. 1 Peter 2, verse 24 to 25 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. It's done, and now we have returned to him as our Shepherd, another one of those guiding terms. He guides, he walks alongside. 
No longer do we have the burden of our sin to carry. He's done it. And now he says, come here. I want to gently and I want to humbly lead you. To me, that sounds like rest. This is how a commentator, Augsburger, describes it in his commentary on Matthew. He says this, such rest is the singleness of relationship with Christ, being one with him, being yoked with him. The rest of knowing his provision as a completed salvation. Discipleship. Following him, being yoked to him, is thereby kept from being a legalistic striving of do this and do that or else, and is instead a joyous fellowship. No longer a legalistic striving, but a joyous fellowship. Me and Jesus plowing the field together. So it's about resting in our salvation. Jesus has done it. Our works will not save us. Our work will not get us to the eternal rest he has for us. But I think there's something every day in here as well, something so very practical, and it's about our sanctification. How does it look to daily enter that rest relationship? First, pausing weekly, right now online, Come and connect with Jesus. You hear messages that encourage you to walk with Him and to live lives of kingdom influence. He gently leads you in that way. I believe Pastor John is passionate about leading you to Christ. And I know your other church leaders are as well. But how about in the busyness of our everyday lives? How can we enter into this type of rest And that sanctify us. I think the answer lies in that picture of the oxen walking and working together. Being disciplined with rest is not just hurrying from one thing to another, thinking that our very lives depend on doing things as fast and efficient as possible. Maybe this is one of those things that this season of coronavirus is teaching us. Slow down a bit. Maybe it's outside of that business meeting, taking a quick stop to become silent and acknowledge that you are walking into this meeting yoked to Christ. Lord, help me to know how to make godly decisions in this meeting. Maybe it's taking time at five in the morning or six or seven to spend time in the quiet of the morning to acknowledge that you are going into this day with the Lord by your side, yoked to Him. Maybe it's simply turning off the music that you're listening to and reading through one of the gospel writings. Just spend time reading about who Jesus is. In our ultra-connected world, it might be leaving your phone somewhere as you enter the house so that you can spend uninterrupted time with your kids or with Jesus. Or maybe simply to turn off for a little while for the sake of connecting to the relationships that mean the most in your life. It might be taking that nap that you know you need. And before that nap, simply stating, Lord, thank you for your rest. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. Thank you that you are fully awake and working even when I sleep. And then, rest easy. Whatever the case is, I believe it is allowing the Lord to gently guide us to the way of life that is not necessarily easy, but a life that is truly life. So whether that's taking a moment, an hour, a day, a vacation, come, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and learn from me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we go into this week yoked to you. 
Lord, we rest in your salvation. Thank you for the completed work that you have done on the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you rose and that you are working in our world. We want to rest in that truth today. Give us time this week. Show us time. Remind us of time that we can spend with you and in your word. Lord, we want to go into each situation walking beside you. We submit to your leadership. We don't want to go our own way. We know that a lot of chaos happens when we go our own way. And so, Lord, we put ourselves under your leadership today. And we yoke ourselves to you today. Thank you so much for the promises in your word, and thank you so much that you guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Blaine, for that very encouraging message. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in song this morning. And thank you, everybody, for joining us online. And we pray that you'll have a very blessed day and a wonderful week. May God bless you and guide you in his hands. In Jesus' name, amen.